Hey everyone, Hal here. Today's video is going to be a little shorter than usual. I just want to cover one thing about qubit states that I didn't quite get to in the first video of the quantum computing fundamentals series. If you haven't seen the first video on qubits, be sure to check it out. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, make sure to leave a comment down below. All right, let's get into it. So what is it that I want to cover today? Well, today we're going to be talking about the block sphere. This right here is called the block sphere. It is a way of visualizing the state of a single qubit. Any possible vector that you can be used to represent a qubit can be represented by a point on this sphere. And when we apply a quantum gate to a qubit, its state changes and we can visualize this resulting state as some rotation or reflection on the sphere. Make sure you like and subscribe so you catch the next video in the quantum computing fundamental series where I explain the mathematical foundation for quantum gates. The reason behind why we can map a two-dimensional vector to a three-dimensional sphere is a bit unintuitive, so let's step back a bit and talk about qubit states again. In the last video on qubits, link in the top corner, we learned about how we can represent a qubit state using a vector of two numbers called amplitudes. The one constraint on these amplitudes is that the sum of them squared must be equal to one. This constraint is due to the fact that the square of an amplitude is a probability, and all probabilities must sum to one. The interesting thing about this constraint is that it does not limit us just to numbers between zero and one. Instead, our amplitudes can be negative or even complex numbers. Complex numbers are what allow us to see a state vector as a point in a three-dimensional sphere. This vector right here is a description of a possible qubit state. So long as the square of these entries is one, this is a valid state. So in this state, we actually have four degrees of freedom, which are needed to describe the state. A1, B1, A2, and B2 can all be varied. So now we have a new problem. Instead of not having enough dimensions, we now have one too many. So what other lens can we look at a state like this through in order to place it onto a three-dimensional sphere? The reason we can place this vector onto a three-dimensional sphere is due to the fact that global phase does not actually affect a qubit state. Look at these two vectors. The only difference between these two vectors is a global phase vector. That is to say that the only difference is that we have multiplied the original state with a negative one. I'm omitting a normalizing factor here, but for clarity, if this was a real state vector, you would need to normalize both of them such that their length was one. This negative one not only doesn't affect measurement, it is actually not possible to build any circuit which could distinguish these two states. So for all intents and purposes, these states are the same. For this reason, we can say that a global phase factor doesn't matter. Because of this, when discussing phase in a quantum system, it is customary to reserve the negative sign for the amplitude in the one state. Both of these states are exactly the same, they differ only by a global phase, so we just always make a habit of leaving the negative on beta in order to simplify notation. Thanks to trigonometric identities, we always know that the sum of cosine squared and sine squared will be equal to one. So with that in mind, we can think of writing a quantum state like this. This allows us to describe a large number of possible states just by varying theta. However, we are missing something that will allow us to describe every possible state. We can augment this previous equation to include a description of phase by using Euler's identity to give us a variable that can be negative or even complex. This new state will look like this. Each e to the i phi allows us to tune the phase of the zero and one state amplitude by controlling phi one and phi two. Instead of just a negative value, we are now considering a phase to be some value of e to the i phi. The reason we can think of phase like this is because as we vary phi, e to the i phi goes from one to negative one, negative one to i, i to negative i, and then back to one. So there's always just a phase factor based on our phi. So with that in mind, let me just restate that this phase factor, when implied to entire state makes no difference. It does not matter at all, so we can just ignore it. These two states are exactly the same. Using this fact, we can actually remove the phase factor on the zero state by applying some algebraic manipulation. If we have this state, we can factor out the e to the i phi one factor. By factoring out this e to the i phi one, we get this equation. Remember, global phase does not matter. So we can actually completely ignore the e to the i phi one here because we are multiplying it with the entire state. This means we can now write our new state like this. The last change we can make to this is to realize that we don't care about phi one and phi two. Since in this equation, they just evaluate to some constant, we can replace them with another variable to get this equation. So now we have found a way to write any qubit state in terms of two variables, theta and phi. So, since we are limited to vectors of length one, which can be varied by two degrees of freedom, theta and pi, this means that we can now plot all of the possible states on a sphere. This is what the block sphere is. Any single qubit state can exist on this sphere. Unfortunately, no such easy visualization exists for multiple qubits. 
The top and bottom of the block sphere represent the 0 and 1 states. Then any other position will be some superposition of the 0 and 1 state. And all we need to do to describe that state is determine the theta and phi values for it. Going forward, it can be really helpful to try to visualize states as points on this sphere. When we get into quantum gates, the block sphere provides a good way of understanding how gates can modify states by rotating their state vectors. So with that, I want to wrap up today's short video on the block sphere. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe. We have a lot of great content coming up soon that you definitely don't want to miss out on.